Another challenging thing about lower third molar impactions is that you have to reflect the flap that you design and in size. <laughs> and that can be a bit of a challenge when you're getting going as well. So as we talked about, the envelope flap is sometimes a little bit more work to reflect or get open than would be a triangular flap. But nonetheless, that is typically my flap of choice. So the first thing I would say, and we've already got the incision made here, but prior to doing this incision, you're gonna be doing your buckle block, which you'll all be doing. Only I would suggest putting a fair bit of solution in there. So at least 0.6 mils and probably even close to 0.8 or 0.9 is what I typically would do. And what you're doing there is you're just trying to get some fluid in under the tissues to assist with the reflection of your flap. Now, when we are actually reflecting the flap, there's a couple ways to do it. And I'm gonna show you the envelope flap example here. Basically, what you're gonna do is you're gonna make your distal incision, which has already been made. We'll just trace over that. And then you're gonna carry it around the teeth. You're including the papilla in your incision. And then what you're gonna do is you're gonna take your periosteal. And I can't emphasize enough, you have to have a sharp periosteal. So sharpen them if you need to, if you've got old ones. Probably the best thing to do is just throw them out and get brand new ones because working with a dull periosteal is like trying to use a spoon to get the tissues off of the bone and that is challenging. You're gonna tear them, you're gonna have a tough time getting your flaps open. So have a sharp periosteal with a sharp tip. When you poke yourself, it should feel a little bit uncomfortable. And then what you're gonna do, so let's say we've done our incision, we've carried all that through. We're gonna use our periosteal now to lift the papilla. So we're gonna start here, we'll say between the uh, first molar here and the lower second premolar. And all we're gonna do is we're gonna push into here, down to the bone, and you're going to, I'm gonna turn this so you can see. So you push down into there and you are going to essentially twist your periosteal. So you're gonna twist and kind of lift is what you're gonna do. And then you're gonna trace around the sulcus here you're gonna do the same thing. You're gonna twist and lift and push that papilla away. And now what you're gonna do is you're going to start to work with the tip of the periosteal on the bone underneath, going back and forth, trying to lift and free that flap, sort of in the side to side kind of a motion. As you do that, you're gonna end up opening up a bit of a gap alongside the teeth where you can then get this broader sort of working end of your periosteal in there which again should be sharp and you should have the tip on the bone. You're gonna put it in and you're gonna push it distally. And as you push it distally and you slide it along the bone back here, what's gonna happen is this tissue is gonna fall open and now you're gonna have this nice area where you can then place a retractor to control the tissues. Okay, so it's that simple. <laughs> in the mouth it won't be quite that easy, but when you get going with it, it, it will be. I shouldn't say it won't be that easy. It will be once you get good at it, but initially it's gonna take you some time. And don't worry about that. Don't worry about getting to the next step when you're taking these teeth out. You wanna do every step really well, and the flap is the key thing, because if you're working with a puny flap, a flap that's poorly designed or poorly reflected, it's going to really hinder you when you're trying to get the tooth out. So make sure you take your time at this step do it properly and get it to where you need to be. Now, one thing that I can tell you, and I mentioned this already, is that when you're trying to open this up, sometimes this distal part's tough to kind of get right open because it's really fibrous back there. If that's the case, you can complete that with some sharp scissors. You just get in there, snip it, and you're good to go. The other instrument that can be helpful for reflecting a flap, and not so much for the envelope flap, but if you're doing a triangular flap, is a 69 W chisel. So this has a handle like an elevator. It has a flat broad end on it and a sharp tip. What you would do, let's say if you cut a triangular uh, incision over here, is you get your triangular incision, you would put this into the vertical part of it on the bone, and then you push backwards. So push down on the bone, slide it back, and it's going to push all that tissue back off of the bone. You're going to get a nice uh, reveal of the tooth that you're about to work on. So the next thing is how far do we reflect this flap? Well, we want to go just a hair beyond the external oblique ridge. We talked about that already. It's that anterior ramus, kind of that bony projection that you see that traces all the way down to the mental foramen. That's kind of your stopping point. What you want to do is just get slightly past there just so that you can get your Minnesota in underneath of that ridge, which will then stabilize the Minnesota retractor when you're in there 
and it gives you a good solid spot to hold that. So again, when you're holding this, you're gonna hold it more at the tip like this and you're gonna tow it out, they call it. So you basically lean it on the bone, tow it out like that. For one thing, it gets your hand out of the way so that you're not obscuring the field of view or getting your hand way in the patient's mouth. And it also helps you to just keep the flap open nicely by applying a little bit more torque with that longer lever here. So it's easier to retract everything when you're holding it in that manner by the tip. Now, when we reflect this flap, we don't want to be constantly repositioning our retractor. So the key here, and this is partly why I like using envelope flaps, is once you have this reflected, now you've got a place where you can slip this in under the external oblique ridge and you can lean this out just like that and maybe a little bit further posterior. Now you've got great access to this area that we're going to be working on. So the other thing we want to do here too, and I didn't do this initially, is you want to lift this lingual tissue off and you use that usually with the, uh, do it with the broad end of the periosteal. So you get in underneath of here, you're going to lift this tissue away. Make sure your subperiosteal, meaning that this is on bone or tooth, the entire time as to not compromise the lingual nerve. You're gonna get this right opened up like that. And now look at your surgical field. You can see everything in there. Typically after just a short period of time, you're not gonna really encounter much bleeding anymore. It's gonna be nice and clear. You've got this nice little container, this little pocket here that's gonna collect fluid. It's gonna collect any shavings, anything that's going on throughout the procedure, it's going to pool in here. And now your assistant can just kind of suction this out, keep it clean. Everything is very isolated. I really, really like this design of the flap. Now, what happens if we reflect this flap too far? Let's say that we take it back beyond the external oblique ridge. Why don't we want to do that? We don't want to do that because you're going to be opening up what's called physiologic dead space. Now, physiologic dead space is basically just a pocket of tissue which didn't need to be open and it's dissecting through it's essentially a fascial plane. So it's opening up a space for hematomas to form. So say blood pooling into this empty space that wouldn't have been there had you not reflected the tissues that far. Or other things like a seroma. That's another thing that can form. That's a collection of blood plasma and inflammatory fluids. So just your edema is going to be greater. You're going to have a greater area that collects fluid that is stagnant and probably contaminated because you have this open. So when you have contaminated stagnant fluid in the mouth, that's a recipe for an, an infection. And so not good to do that. So make sure, again, when we're looking here, we want to stop the reflection at the external oblique ridge or just slightly beyond so that we can kind of link our, our elevator or sorry, our retractor underneath of that. Now, typically, just as a rule of thumb, to know that you've reflected things adequately, you should see maybe about four to five millimeters of bone just distal or just buccal to the tooth in question. So when you're taking out that impaction, you should have everything opened up like this and you should just see, like we can here, a little bit beyond the distal portion of that tooth. So that's gonna give you great access for troughing around it, which is the next video that we're going to cover. One point to touch upon again with the lingual reflection here. So let's say that we're lifting this tissue off of here. Anytime that you're lifting a lingual flap, and again, from our other videos, you know that there's nothing wrong with this. It's just there's a higher incidence of paresthesias or nerve involvement of the lingual nerve when you do that, especially if you're applying any tension or you're reflecting incorrectly. One way to minimize the amount of lingual nerve involvement is to release the tissue more in the coronal aspect prior to pulling it away on the lingual side. So what I mean by that is occasionally you may wish to release a little bit more, say around the collar of the second uh, molar here. And then what that gives you is a little bit more play in your flap so that you're not reflecting it under tension. So let's say that you had to get under here like I showed previously uh, in our other video uh, to get the tooth out, to get the tissue off of it, perhaps it's really tight when you're pulling on it, trying to get the tissue out of the way. One way to counteract that, like I said, is just release this a little bit. Now you're going to have a little bit more room to lift the tissue away without stretching that nerve. What type of retractor do you want to use? Well, there's all different types. I showed you the Minnesota. This is the, this is the one that I like to use, and it's certainly one that's pretty common. This guy here, this is a Selden retractor. This is another one that we have around the office. I've used it in the past. I'm not as much of a fan, I guess, as the Minnesota. 
And another one that will be commonly employed is an Austin retractor, and those come with all different configurations, but basically it's kind of like an L shape, so it gives you something to hang on to and something that will fit down into the, the pocket of the uh, flap here. So let's picture maybe a Minnesota with a bit of a bend on it, um, like an L. Now, when we're looking at placing your retractor into this flap that you've created, usually what you want to do is you want to insert it into this mesial portion of the flap, and then you're going to slide it posteriorly until you get right to sort of the distal aspect of it. That's where you're going to be underneath the external oblique ridge, holding it on the tip to tow out the, re the retractor to give you good visibility and good retraction of the cheek and the tissues. That prevents slipping of the retractor, keeps your visibility up, it speeds the procedure because you're not constantly repositioning, it helps so you're not traumatizing the tissue as well uh, because if you're constantly trying to replace this and you're moving the tissue or whatnot, you're going to cause some damage to it. If you keep it on the bone, that's another good tip, so it should never be sitting on the tissue. If you're holding your retractor on the tissue, it does have a fairly sharp end or kind of an end that could cut the tissue if it is placed too firmly on the tissue. So always keep it on the bone. That's another thing to keep in mind.